My name is Luke. The Apostle Paul called me the physician to distinguish me from any other Lukes who might be there. And that's exactly what I was. I am a physician. I'm a physician that was inspired by God to make a detailed account of Jesus Christ. His journey that begins from heaven, comes to earth, and returns to heaven once again. Gifted by God in many languages, Aramaic, Greek, Hebrew, and even Latin, I wrote a book, and I wrote the book for the church. Later, they have named it the Gospel of Luke. There is a companion book to that, too. Later on, Acts of the Apostles. But tonight, we're going to concentrate upon the Gospel. I carefully investigated all people. You see, I didn't witness these events myself. But what I did was I went to Jesus' apostles. I went to his early disciples, those who were first with him. And I even went to Jesus' family. All this I did in order to get a comprehensive, accurate account for all unbaptized and baptized people so that they would know firsthand about Jesus Christ, their Lord and their Savior. Now I begin with Jesus coming from heaven to earth. I begin in the temple. It's Herod's temple. What a magnificent structure this was. Any place in Jerusalem and any road coming into Jerusalem, you could see this massive temple. Now it's actually a replacement temple. The first temple was built during the time of Solomon. That temple was dedicated to God. And in that temple, God's presence was always there. This temple, however, was dedicated to Herod, the king, a king appointed by Caesar. In the temple, every evening, they would burn incense. They would relight the incense. It went 24 hours a day, but in the evening they would come and relight the incense. It was always done by a priest of a particular tribe. And this was actually the turn of the time of the tribe of Abijar. And what they do is they gather all of these priests together that belong to that family, and they cast lots to see who will go in that evening to burn incense and to say prayers. Well, the lot falls upon a man by the name of Zechariah. Now, Zechariah has a wife, and they are both righteous, walking before God. They are all from the priestly line. Both of them, actually, are from the priestly line of Abraham's brother Aaron. But yet, they have not received a gift of a child until now. Zechariah goes in and does his priestly duties, lighting the incense, and right to the right of the incense, an angel appears to him. The angel is Gabriel. He announces the fact that Elizabeth will have a child. Now, maybe to us that wouldn't seem amazing, except for the fact that both Zechariah and Elizabeth are way beyond childbearing years. They're old. Zechariah doubts the word of this angel. And he is made to be silent until his son is born. His son, who will be named John, meaning the Lord has shown favor. This John will be the Elijah to come. From the Old Testament, he was to precede the Christ precede the Messiah. Gabriel tells this of his son, John. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit from conception and make ready for the Lord a people prepared. 
Now in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sends his angel Gabriel one more time. He sends him to a small town in Galilee, the town of Nazareth. Sends him to one individual person. She's a virgin, and her name is Mary. Gabriel says, greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. Mary is startled by, first of all, an angel, and second of all, the strange greeting that this angel is giving her. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. Mary is told about the coming reign of God. The reign of God that will begin right in her womb, will begin with her, and it's coming soon. Not doubting like Zechariah doubted the word of Gabriel. Mary believes Gabriel and yet wonders, how could this be possible if she was a virgin? Which she is. Gabriel explains to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. For nothing is impossible with God. Mary has only one thing to say to the angel. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Mary becomes the obedient servant of God's plan of salvation. During this conversation of Gabriel with Mary, she also mentions the fact that her cousin Elizabeth is going to have a baby and is right now six months pregnant. So Mary hurries off and goes to this smaller town in Judea to visit her cousin. When she arrives, she greets Elizabeth, and just with the words of the greeting, Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, realizes that Mary, Mary is carrying the Messiah within her, within her very womb. And the baby John within her leaps for joy at this, filled with the Holy Spirit. Mary is so moved to joy by this announcement and by all that God is planning and all that God is bringing forth that she sings a song of praise to God. Now the early church will call this song the Magnificat. My soul magnifies the Lord. And it begins this way. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. Mary now returns to Nazareth. At the birth and circumcision of his son, Zechariah, is still unable to speak. His tongue is still tied. So at the birth, they ask the mother, what are you going to name the child? Elizabeth says, John. Well, nobody you know, nobody in your family is named John. Why, why would you do that? So they look to Zechariah. Zechariah asks for a writing tablet, and he writes on the tablet, his name is John. And immediately, he can speak again. His tongue is loosened and he can speak loudly. And he gives a praise to God. And this is what he prophesies. My child will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go and prepare the way for him to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. And blessed be the Lord God of Israel, 
For he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up the horn of salvation for us in the house of David. The reign of God on earth is just about to begin. To further burden God's oppressed people, a census is called, ordered by Caesar Augustus, the emperor of the Roman Empire, requiring all people to return to their hometowns, their place where their ancestors first came from. Purpose? So that he would know who they were and that they could all be taxed. Amazingly, and it shouldn't be amazing to us as Christians, amazingly, God uses this event, uses Caesar, the emperor, to bring Mary and Joseph back to Bethlehem to fulfill what was promised back in the book of Isaiah 700 years before. Mary and Joseph are both descendants of David. So they leave Nazareth on an 80-mile journey, 80 miles. They cross over the mountains. They come into the land of Canaan. They go through Canaan into Jericho. They go from Jericho into the wilderness of Judea. They travel through the wilderness of Judea, and they come to Jerusalem. And finally, they make it to Bethlehem. And so... The Messiah was born in Bethlehem. And Mary wrapped him in swaddling cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. It is at this very moment in time that the word of God is made flesh, flesh and blood, to the praise of God. And that's done for us and for our salvation. And the reign of God on earth has now begun. That evening, away from Bethlehem, there are some shepherds gathered out on the hillside. And all of a sudden, there's only one at first. But an angel appears to them. And the glory of God lights up the entire sky. And they're frightened. They're fearful. They don't know what's going on. The sky explodes with the light of the glory of God. And then a great company of the light adds to it. Heavenly hosts add to this. It's unbelievable, it's unmistakable, more than we could ever even imagine. And with one voice, they cry out, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. And then they see the angels ascend back into heaven. The humble shepherds, keeping watch over their flocks at night, just as David had done centuries before, before he came king. They are given a personal invitation by God to visit God in the flesh, to visit the manger, to visit Mary and Joseph, to visit the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, the Anointed One. So they immediately go and see God in the manger, in Jesus Christ. But they can't hold on to their praise and glory of God because they share that message with everyone with whom they come into contact. Everyone. Fellow Christians, like the shepherds, we can never keep this good news of Jesus Christ amongst ourselves. Even though we celebrate tonight that silent night, that holy night, we need to burst forth with a message of Jesus Christ who came from heaven to earth for all people, for each and every one of them. 
to give them their salvation. There's so much more I could tell you about Jesus' journey from heaven to earth and back to heaven, but I'm going to leave it right here with you tonight. I'm going to leave you right where you are in this very special event, this very special night. But there are more than you gathered on this evening. There are Christians around the world gathered for one purpose, to hear the announcement of Jesus Christ, their Savior, who came from heaven to earth. And with one voice, with others around the world, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace on whom his favor rests. I wrote this gospel for a mission church. I wrote this gospel for you.